This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Hi, Cello Bello fans. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so sorry we're getting started a little bit late today, but we are joined by Lawrence. Um, who will be giving us uh, a wonderful talk today. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Lawrence. Uh, thanks very much, Isaac. Um, you know, talking to, to people who are playing the cello as adult learners, I suppose covers uh, a, a wide variety of people, people who stop playing as I did for some length of time, and people who have begun playing as adults. And, you know, so I guess this, this what I have today is, is, is mostly for the first group, but also I think applies to people who are, who have just recently begun, because I think the lessons that I learned returning to the cello were were not just about how to do it, how to get through the 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 first steps of 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 your former, you know, achieving your former glory as a player, but also how to how to understand the the tremendous feeling of self-realization that happens when you when you when you when you return and you play and most particularly <clears throat> when you practice uh, now practicing is is sort of the one core of what we do and the other thing is <clears throat> playing excuse me <clears throat> is playing with other people. So let me give you a little background on how I started out as a cellist and then returned and left it and then returned. I started playing the cello when I was 10 years old. Um, my best friends, I was never good enough and I never practiced enough to become a professional, but I came became proficient at moving around and reading music. And when I was at uh, late teens, I met Jeff Solo, the great Jeff Solo, and the great Terry King became a great friend of mine. And they went off to become Piatigorsky students, and I somehow became the part owner of a music bookstore in Los Angeles. And we always kept in touch, and I always kept playing the cello until I was, I think, I must have been in my mid 40s when I was in Iowa and somehow I I just left my cello in Iowa when I came back to Los Angeles and for 30 years I had stopped playing and occasionally friends would say you have to play again here here take this cello and they would give me a cello for 6 months and maybe I would try it once. And the finger was too hard to push the strings down and I couldn't make a sound. Then two years ago, two years ago, 2022, a friend of mine, a French friend of mine, called me up from Paris and said, I'm putting on an opera in the middle of France, a little Mozart opera. We need a cellist. Come. And I said, Dan, you're crazy. I haven't played in 30 years, literally. He wouldn't take no for an answer. He sent me the music. It was very simple. 
everything in D major, a little stuff in B flat, piece of cake. But I hadn't played for 30 years. So I called Terry, Terry King. He said, no problem. You can do it. You were always a natural talent. Wow, that made me feel good. Then I contacted and 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 he gave me he gave me some recommendations for beginning out. Two weeks, two weeks of open strings. You know, pretend you're playing scales, pretend you're playing the Dvorak concerto. Stick bow quickly, slowly, up and down, so forth. Two weeks later, I had a sound. I can't believe it. Then I start playing and fingering, and the finger muscle memory all comes back immediately. No calluses, no blood, nothing. But I have this problem. I keep looking at my at my bow, my my bow hand and wrist when I shift bows, and it's like, up, oh, how do I do change? Up, oh, how do I change? Have these little hiccups between bow changes. So I go to another friend of mine. Yevgeny Tonka, who's the son of the great Gubai Dulina cellist, a collaborator, and he, he said, it's very simple, no problem, just think this way, up bow, push, down bow, pull. It solved the problem for me to this day, I don't look at it, I don't bother, whatever happens, it works. The other thing I learned from Evgeny was that he had invited me over to his house to listen to me play. And when I, when he corrected something, I would say, oh, oh, okay, okay, I'll do it at home. I, I didn't want him to hear my, me make the mistake again. I didn't realize that there were teachers who would be willing to let you, to listen to you make a mistake for half an hour just until you could get, you know, embrace it and deal with it and resolve it. So th with those two lessons in, 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 in hand, I was able to go to France and, and, and it was an amazing experience. I was the only American in a, an orchestra of 25 French amateurs, mostly, if you, few professionals, led actually by uh, a wonderful violinist who just had an article a year ago in the Strad about how to deal with setting up your string in instrument, dealing with the different planes of, of energy from the different strings and so forth. So he was a great, I could look over him, he would, say, he would give me a bowing, an exaggerated way to bow. I learned so much from him. I had such a great, I had such a great feeling being in an orchestra again. Um, you know, all those times you look up at the the conductor who's, and then you s s smile at each other, and then you play again, and you make these sounds, and it's like, it, it was like wonderful. And the and the ambiance of this performance, these productions, was like Kiss Me Kate, if you know the Cole Porter musical. And it was like we were a troupe of, of traveling Mozartian players, and we played our little Mozart opera in four towns in the middle of France that nobody's ever heard of. Decies, uh, Luzi, uh, Saint-Pierre de Moutier, uh, and one other. And in, in one of them at Saint Pierre Moutier, the ch we played in a church where uh, Joan of Arc had stopped on her way from someplace to someplace else. And we had the orchestra in the alcove, and right over my shoulder was this large, large um, statue of J Joan of Arc. It was, it was quite an experience. So obviously, playing the playing, returning to an instrument, then gives you an opportunity to have all sorts of wonderful adventures. It, you know, it may not be playing Mozart in France, but <clears throat> you never know. Um,
you know, I went to later, later that year, I went to a chamber music camp for adults in the Berkshires, the Ahimsa camp that Lorette Goldberg runs along with um, Kate Dillingham. And I met the most wonderful assortment of, of, of people like me, people, adult learners who were returning and were playing chamber music together. It was just the most extraordinary experience that that I can, I can remember having. Um, you know, in some cases, I would be even be the senior member of an ensemble. And, and the professionals were mostly young kids who were on their way up, who, who were, it was like an assortment of, of, of wonderful Damon Runyon type characters, great musicians, great people. And there was a feisty violist in our Dvorak who, um, who said to me from the from the first rehearsal on, if I may, uh, as you know, you play a note and you make a, a a face, right? And the first time she caught me doing that, she said, "Don't make a face. You know, focus on the music. Don't let it distract you. Don't let the audience know that you made a mistake, either." So that was an important lesson to learn, and it's a good lesson to learn when you're practicing. You know, I, I, I don't know that I've seen that in the literature, that not making a face is a good idea, even when you're rehearsing by yourself. So, so that, was, that, that was a wonderful experience. And then I came home, and I had the unbelievable great luck to, be, to live two houses away, from a, a violinist who's been in the Pasadena Symphony for 40 years. She studied with Ruggiero Ricci for five years. And she was looking for someone to play chamber music. And as soon as I started playing, we get together now with a pianist, one of a few pianists that we know, and just, you know, play chamber music for for until we drop with exhaustion. And that's why I mentioned the, you know, the Schubert, the Schubert E flat trio. That's what we're working on. And and it's 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 extraordinary how much you learn about the music that you love. You know, if if you've never really played the Schubert trios other than a movement here or there, and you accustomed to listening to it and knowing all the things that you want it to be like. And, and especially if you're a critic, you're listening, how do they do this? How do they do that? When you're playing it, it's something totally different. It's, it's incredibly dif difficult, exhausting, backbreaking. The, the, the unfinished version of the last movement of the Schubert has these insane repetitions of this insanely silly middle section with an insanely difficult little passage that it's going to take me six months to learn how to play. But after you've done, after you've, after you've done after you've gotten to the end of a reading session like that, where you say you started out with, you know, you started out with maybe Mozart and C major trio, and then you went to, then you did some of the foray, which is gorgeous and totally different and takes different neural thinking uh, and then the Schubert, and you're finished, and it's like you're really tired. You've done you, and 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 you feel like you're capable of, you know, you you're like an athlete. You're in good shape. Tired. Um, you know, it's it's funny that what you find out about yourself as well when you. When you when you look at when you when you 
look at all the questions that that I certainly thought of when I was writing about my experiences was, you know, I mean, like the questions on on the cello chat questionnaire. What's on your what's on your what's on your music stand? And I always have the Schubert Trio. I always have what I'm playing next. And but what's the first thing I, I play every day? And that is that is the opening of the third cello suite of Schubert of Ma of Bach. I mean I can play that. I love playing that. It makes me feel alive and the cello feels alive and And I think when my wife hears it, wherever she is in the house, I know she smiles because it was she who urged me to go back to the cello and to actually buy a cello so I would continue uh, this wonderful adventure. In fact, in fact, um, You know, she's <clears throat> she's been an indissoluble partner. And I was thinking that this interest in adult learning on my part happened, started during the pandemic because Because I, the stories I found myself writing were talking to musicians having to, having to deal with this, with the pandemic. And, you know, the processes they went through, some of them, some of them had to get over a regret that they were missing concerts that they may never be able to play again. And and this came from from people at quite a high level, like on Sophie Mutter. Um, but I think a lot of a lot of a lot of musicians took this as an opportunity to wind down from the rat race that they had found themselves in so so intensely. I think. It's a it's a tough it's a very competitive business now the classical music industry, and the opportunity to 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 recharge batteries to confront you know morality and mortalities that was all around them, um, and. It was it was a very it was a very moving experience to talk to them, and only now are you really starting to get <clears throat> the wave of new compositions that have resulted from from the pandemic and and what moved people in those days. Um, you know, we never we I don't. I don't know that we want to have any kind of a monumental musical requiem that would serve the way <clears throat> rec like Britain's rec war requiem has has served or Mozart requiem served so so relentlessly but but I think I think it must be coming sometime and and for, for all of these people coming out of the pandemic being able to practice again was something that that really I think I think was that made music making more special to them you know Anyway, the, the 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 thing the thing that I enjoy practicing most about practicing most now is 
is in addition to knowing that every little bit I improve will result in improvement tomorrow and forever. And will add to the vast amount of improvement. <clears throat> I love I love looking up and seeing that I've exceeded my practice time for this my schedule today. It is just um it is just it is just the best. And when I've exceeded it by an hour, I think I start to realize how how you could practice for four or five hours because, because it's just not a dry experience. It's a living experience. It's a coming, it's a coming to an understanding of who you are and and uh why you do things and what what makes you feel alive. And I think even young, because this you remember the same thought processes, the same, the same, the same moments of glory and the same moments of dis of of failure, dissatisfaction. And then after all of that, you can go back to your real life and and um And I think maybe I should I could take this opportunity to to talk about a few new books that I've come across recently. One of them, or I could I could go into some detail about technical tips that I had when I went back to the cello. So maybe I will read a few of the technical chips that tips that I got for some practical value. Ah. After I'd gotten <clears throat> through with the two weeks of open strings, Terry's advice was all four fingers down, lift up and down for fourths and octaves across. Then first fingers making fourths above, sixth below, then the others in similar fashion. Then try the C scale and arpeggio, then D. Then something easy like the simple double stop exercises in Dot Sauer's book one and two to get your frame back in shape. Then try vibrato on first finger from zero, increasing the dynamic to lush. Okay, I did that for what seemed like an eternity. And then, as you know, I talked to Tonka. Then I turned to another old cello friend, Roger LeBeau, who was not concerned about technical difficulty. He, he agreed with Terry that my old former cello night uh, knowledge might be well ingrained in my muscle memory. What he thought would be a big challenge was overdoing it. He said, what, you have to look out for ramping back up without overdoing it. Listen to your body. Take a lot of breaks, especially at first. Don't wait until you feel actual pain. As a corollary, he added, keep the notion of relaxation at the forefront of your thoughts. He cautioned players coming back from a break and beginning students as well to not hold tension in the right thumb. Make sure it's not locked. The neck or the shoulders or in pressing with the thumb and fingers of the left hand. I talked to Zachary Carrington in Boulder who does the Boulder Bach Festival and is a marvelous uh, violist too and violinist. He recommended slow, easy, relaxed scales sliding lightly from note to note to a slow metronome. Come back to playing with ease, release, and joy. 
letting everything come from a place of, con of comfort. This also has become a mantra in my, in my daily practicing, to remembering what Zachary told me, to every time I find that I'm forcing a shift, I'm forcing any kind of movement that requires, that requires you know, accuracy and placement, to let it go and just to take a deep breath and to slide lightly makes the biggest difference of all. Um, you know, there was uh, a book that came out by Janet Horvath, Playing Less Hurt, an injury prevention guide for musicians. And she advised increase your load gradually, start with 10 minutes, increase the number of 10 minute sessions before advancing to longer sessions, release every finger, only the plain finger should be pressing. Don't squeeze or press with either thumb. Play with the least amount of tension and use weight, not force. Warm up. Take breaks. Take time to wiggle and move during practice. So if you're not wiggling, you know... <clears throat> that there's more you can do to in, in accelerate and improve your comeback. You know, it's, 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 it's the thing, it's, it's the things about playing the cello that have made it possible for me to even imagine that I'm a music critic. Because when you become so intimate with how music works, how making all of these sounds work, you come to realize that even the most, even the most, you know, annotated, marked up by the composer, even music that's totally marked every bar how slow how fast how loud how soft there are still an infinity of 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 of, of decisions that the musician has to make in, in executing those things and even if it's even if it's the most complicated music you feel that as a musician and for cellists particularly the the bach the Bach cello suites are the ultimate example of, of music that has no markings that we know, that every, every slur, every fingering, every dynamic is some editor's imagination. And it, it, it makes playing a box suite, even though you can't do everything in the crossing strings, because you give up before the end of the movement, and then you come back and you play the opening half until it just, you can't play anymore, and then you move around, which is what I do in my, in my warm-up sessions. Um, it gives you so much insight into, into, into what making music is all about, and it makes you wonder what what did the what did the composers hear? Did they could they have imagined all these different possibilities? It's such a it's such an interesting question, and we'll never know. But we come. We, I think we we by playing ourselves, we 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 share in the in the power and and the and the and the challenge um um ice skater 60 has just said that she had she had one year of lessons when she was 34 and then 30 years later she started the lessons, take, taking lessons again 
a month ago. Uh, you know, it's it's it's. I think the message is is too that I all all the tips that I I I've mentioned I guess are you can find one way or another, but if you can find within your own community of friends or teachers people to contact and reach out of reach out to and ask all the questions you have um it can make it it's you'll find you'll find you'll find people are are literally dying to help someone someone who is in our situation i i don't know why i um I guess that's what we would do if we were professionals and someone, if we met someone like that. You know, it's a, uh, it was, um, it was a, uh, the, the, in the, in the orchestra I played in in France, the players were all of a all of a very different level. There were the five professionals, and then there were five or ten other players who probably who probably were sort of amateurs. Um, they weren't. They were okay. I mean, and and then there were the players who who were below that. And and we made a good sound. We made a good noise. And the cellist, I was a ch the one cellist. The cellist next to me was maybe my age or a few years younger. She was deaf in her left ear and not so good in her right ear. But she would change bowings with me, so that was good. The third cellist, was someone who'd only been playing for a year. So, so I was sort of the principal cellist all of a sudden. And, and, and it's in those, so, so, you know, I, I got to know everybody in the orchestra and they thought I was a swell guy and they, it was fun having somebody from America and I learned a little bit my to my make my French a little bit better. I met I met an uh, an English an English American expat couple who were living around there. She they had been what did she do? She they had worked with deaf with disabilities at the international scale level, um, and then, then there are all the, and then for me, there are all the really exciting, you know, professional people I know. So I'm lucky that way. For instance, Dan, that that my French friend, I met Dan in Lisbon in 2019, at a music festival in the Academy, run by a, a Portuguese pianist named Felipe Pinto Ribeiro, and Dan. Dan came over and he had friends who were giving master classes, the cellist Gary Hoffman and the, the principal oboist of the Orchestre de Paris, uh, Pascal Moragues. And we hit it off. We hit it off. And by the end of the festival, he had invited me to Paris two months later to help celebrate his 50th birthday. And that's and so he 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 he's an amateur violist and violinist, have a few not not too expensive instruments, can recognize the Stradivarius. He says, listening to it, is, you know. So I go go on. You see, not everybody can have these great adventures, but but. They only happened because people reached out to me and things happened. Um, I, I want, while I've got you here, I'd like to recommend a new autobiography by Felix Ayo called Around the World with a Violin. 
Felix Ayo, you probably know as the violinist who made, who became synonymous with Vivaldi's Four Seasons with his recordings with the Musici. But he was, he was more than just a Baroque violinist. In fact, he was the opposite. He was, he was, he was a major romantic violinist in the, in the great traditions who happened to become involved with Vivaldi. And he had an extraordinary life. And I think he's, he's documented it in such detail, but there are parts of it, you know, that are very, that are very, that are very touching. Um, and particularly what's interesting is that he didn't start learning traditional technique as we think of it through, through, he, 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 until he was 19 or 20, he, he won prizes. He never studied the great technical exercises. He just played the music. We don't want the teachers to hear that, but he did admit that when he started out at 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 some level, he had to finally come to grips with all the great exercises. Um, <clears throat> but it was nice to find out about somebody like that. It's also sort of a a, a humbling reminder his career of. Of how of how musicians have had to fight to get where they are today, you know, to be paid to have unions which fight for them. When when Felix Ayo came over with the Musici on American on tours of America, um, they were they were paid twenty five dollars a day and a different concert every night, which they travel to by bus. Um, and they had to play 13 nights in a row and only would get off on the 14th night. But the money they got went a long way when they went back to Italy and they, you know, they, they lived a nice life. And Felix Ayo, let's see. Just looking through this book. <clears throat> something that I would like, something else that I would like to share in the time we have left is, is my own background and how I came to be where I am in the music industry and a music critic, because it wasn't my cello playing skills, obviously. When I was... When I had my, my I was born into a show business family, I guess. My dad was a, a radio and a screenwriter and a TV writer. He wrote Rawhide, wrote Rawhide and and I married a monster from outer space, my mother, of course, and um and I had trouble finding myself. And I was working in one of the great record stores in Los Angeles when I met a man who was coming in looking for recordings by uh, Wilhelm Furtwängler. And I had I had grown up on Furtwängler's recordings of Beethoven and and Schubert, and so I was eager to show him the section, show him the recordings. And he said, well, you know, you know that, that I, I have a music store 
would you like to come over? And so I came over, it was in the back of his house. Um, it turned out he, he sold, he sold, his customers were the music libraries of the world, the Library of Congress, um, Bibliothèque Nationale, UCLA Music Library, so forth and so on. And he was looking for an assistant to unpack books and pack them and ship them out and do some invoicing. And later that year, after I had done that, he had a meeting with my parents and offered to apprentice me. So I became an apprentice. And a few years later, I became a, a part owner of the, of the store and, and had the opportunity to become involved with an incredible circle of, of, of people, the friends of the owner of the, of the store. They, he had come from Berlin with his wife before the war. He had been an assistant director to the Städtische Oper in Berlin where Carl Böhm was there and Bing was directing and so forth. And his wife was a Russian pianist who knew Horowitz and knew Piatgorsky. And their friends were the first chair people in the Berlin Philharmonic and they went to all the concerts and they would come over and you know, whatever whatever successes they had achieved after the war, however they had come out, they all missed those days in Berlin in the in in the twenties, really, early thirties. It was really something special and especially and for Piatigorsky especially, I think, who had been very close to Fort Wangler. And it was, it was an experience to know, to know. Meanwhile, I became, basically, I learned to become a librarian because the customers were all these libraries. So I had to learn to do what librarians do, which is to make card catalogs and so forth and summar summarize the contents and learn at least at least superficially about 20 languages or 20 alphabets anyway so that was a very very um enlightening experience uh because why because because I think because for in, ter in terms of of the of of the music making that was done after the war, and when I really started listening to music, those recordings that it was so intense, and that every performance meant so much, and all all these all these expats or not expats but when they found out that there were the russians had had released recordings of the of the tapes that had been made in berlin during the war these people were so ecstatically happy to have that back in their life um you know i um I think I should go back to some of the questions on the list if there are no, oh, a chat. Chat, Duncan says. Thank you. I'm an adult cello. I'm an adult cello in my fourth year. I feel I have an excellent teacher in the USA whom I work with through Zoom. Wow, I lived in the Caribbean, thus isolated from the active classical music scene. What would you what would you recommend for resources to learn more about musical interpretation true to the styles and traditions? Wow, you can well you can look through through Strings magazine for my articles on things like the box suites and the 
you know, the Beethoven Lake Quartets and and uh, Don Quixote and um, um, and I think I've interviewed some of these people I talk about, Zachary Carrington. And I think if you start from there and and start listening to the people who interviewed, you'll see, you'll see, you'll get a, an idea before you become become tied into one tradition or one way of looking at these things. You want to get an idea of how 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 wide the variety of it, what variety of interpretations and and styles are i would say that the that the the most current the most interesting current um situation is that is that people like norrington roger norrington are are focusing on the fact that for classical music, early classical music, certainly Baroque music, what is important is to understand the 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 the, um, the, the musical aesthetics of the time, how they valued grace and gesture and effect much more than sudden dynamic, you know, kabooms. There, it was about. And within that, and then within that sort of generalized way of a of of a of a of a performing, most mostly most Baroque performance, most Baroque composers, and into early Mozart. That's where you want to be. That's where, if you let that inform and you breathe into that and work within it, you're going to find something that's. That's very authentic to to what the what the composer had in mind. You know, if you think that Mozart never really meant an, uh, something to be so slow that it would be what we think of as our total adagio, then you realize there's a lightness and the moving from from note to note that. Once you feel in that mode, then it's up to you and your instruments how you can execute it, how it works for you. But of course, you can always play. You can you can play, say, in a modern revisionist style where you you where you take other tacks. But I think I think the the. The other factor of what means being true is means is 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 commitment, is intensity, you know, to the to great works like a Beethoven symphony. If you if you've experienced what it really means that you that, that you are inside of the music, you know, I always wonder. I, do you remember the first time you listened to a great favorite piece of yours? And has that first performance ever gone out of your head? So, you know, when you're performing yourself, when you're playing yourself, just imagine you're playing for somebody who's never heard it and your performance is what they're going to carry with them. So you don't want to trifle with their emotions. You want to give them the kind of the kind of the kind of experience you had when it, you first realized wow i love this piece wow i've got a love affair with this piece i mean i remember the first time i heard every every major every work probably but then that was my thing i became obsessed with with listening to differences in interpretation from a very early age. My parents had talked about interpretation. What does it mean? What does it mean? You know, what does it mean that Fort Fangler is this way and Karyan is this way and so forth? And I asked and they said, here's, 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 
here's how we'll here, let me show you. And they played they played two different performances of the first opening, just the opening bars of the first movement of Mozart's seventeenth piano concerto, K four five three. Um di dum da dum pum pum di da dum pa da dum pum pa dum so forth. And one was by Edwin Fisher, who was who was who was the 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 inspiration to Daniel Barenboim and was one of the I think was it was a unique type of pianist all to himself. Very he played the he played the Mozart concertos very fast, almost brittly, um, and with great flourishes, and they made them so exciting. The other performance was a recording by the harpsichordist Ralph Kirkpatrick with an, a period instrument orchestra conducted by Alexander Schneider for a long gone record label called Boston Records. And the opening was much more about effect and gesture and the sound was, was, was totally different. Um, and from then on, I've probably devoted my life to hearing those types of differences in, in music, in music, um, in music that I care about and that interests me and it's it's always fascinated me and then I started collecting miniature scores to see what they were starting with you know to see what the, the musicians were starting with and it's been a lifelong adventure um, wow wow uh, but I assume we have a few more seconds left today. Um, I'm counting on Isaiah Isaac to let me know. Yeah, we have a few more seconds. Um, I can also give you some more of our in the practice room questions. Uh, and please, anyone, feel free to, um, you know, final chance to ask questions in the chat, and I can um, uh, relay them to Lawrence here. Um, but yeah, you know, you know, I was, I was, I was th thinking about different genres. Um, you know, I, I, it's, 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 it always strikes me that classical music is thought to have a to have a responsibility to embrace all other genres, especially in these days, and to, you know, embrace it authentically. So, so, and, th and that's been true f for as long as I've been listening to music. So, you know, if you, if, if you really op listen to classical music in all its, in all its, um, in, 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 you know, from the oldest to the newest, you hear all these other genres, and it's not such a. I, I think it's ob pretty obvious that all music is. It sounds like a ridiculous thing to say. All music is music. Um. um you know, I. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the the questions on the list here and I think I've discussed a lot of them at this you know as much as they as they apply I think what's what's interesting is maybe will be to let you know what I'm just been assigned to write in the next 2 weeks and why 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 these things would appeal to someone like an adult learner who's always 
wants to think about the music they're making. One is, one is, um, I know it sounds odd, a discussion of where Haydn performances are of these days of the symphonies. Um, there's a, a new a new set that's nearing completion on modern instruments played by people who know historical performance practice inside out. And there's a, an older set on historical instruments that was just re-released. So So why do I bring that up? I'm not sure. I think I'll go back to the questions here. Um, how do you stimulate creativity and imagination in the practice room? I keep the practice room really as clean as I can, as, as straightened up and as organized, no clutter. And I, I listen to the music the day before on this little great little set of sound of speakers in order to get me ready for playing the next day. And when I go to sleep every night, I have it on my list of what I'm going to work on the next day. Um, do you find inspiration or new ideas outside in the practice room? You know, what I get a lot of inspiration from is going to hear the or any orchestra that's around and watching the cellist play because it, it makes me feel like, wow, I could do that if I, 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 um, I, if, if I had the time, if I had the talent. Um, oh, Duncan, Duncan says some, some more book recommendations, please. You know, the one the I'll 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 recommend a new book for 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 people who want to read about style. It's called Mozart, the Performer, by Dorian Bandy. He's a violinist, and. It's not specifically about strings. He talks about the quintets a little bit. But if you got a chance to see that, I take a look at it. It's very, it's very, um, it's very useful. It's very rational. I would also read for anybody who's interested in ever writing themselves about music, is or even discussing music in sort of a more intricate, intimate manner is to read uh, an English writer named Donald Tovey, T-O-V-E-Y. He wrote a series of musical analysis, essays of, of popular works, and he wrote a lot of the articles for early versions around the turn of the century and after for the Encyclopedia Britannica. And even though he was a, a Latin classicist and knows music perhaps the way nobody since has known it technically and inside and talks about it that way. He also talks so wonderfully descriptively that, that, um, that, that it gives you an idea of how to, not just how to play the music, it's more about how to think about the music and describe the music, you know, I always, in my classes about writing, I always say to students, learn how to s review the same concert, the same musical experience for three different friends. One who knows about music, one who knows about tennis, one knows about foreign affairs, some, some choice. Because that way, and, and Tovey, in, in his odd, florid, extravagant way, gives you permission to do that. So I think that's a good, but that's not about strings. I think about, about if you can find Tully Potter's biography of Adolf Bush, um, 
his 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 style of for Beethoven and Brahms was perhaps the purest that we've had. Um, what other books? Uh, I told you about the Felix Io. Um, you know, there's a there's a very curious book that came out recently by Dmitri Badiarov called The Cello da Spala. I think you can find it on 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 Amazon. It's easy to find on Amazon. And the Viola da Spala is is this perhaps apocryphal instrument with five strings about 30 inches long tune between the viola and the cello played with a string around strap around the neck like this and he it's an extraordinary instrument Bach apparently expected to pl play the six suite on such an instrument there's a few Daspala virtuosos including Sergei Malov and I've heard it a couple of times, and what it can do is will blow your mind. It has such projection and bite and beauty, but it is unwieldy a little bit and strange. So Dmitry Badiarov just published a book about how to how violinists and violists can learn to play the the cello da spalla how they can find more work op opportunities. This is a sort of like a self-help book by, by Dimitri. And, and it's in the middle of it, he goes into a lot of detail about style, about how you would play the, how the players of the time approached Playing it, what they, what, how they looked at the music that was in front of them, you know, and how it was so much more a springboard than we really can imagine. So that, for instance, when I heard Sergei Malov play one of the Vivaldi concertos, he started improvising before the concerto started and he kept on improvising after it was over. Um, you know, this thing about style, it's, it's like, it becomes, it becomes a very intriguing philosophical concept. Um, uh, But but of uh, but of course there are there are others. For instance, you know, you know, think about this. Did he? Are they? Are they? You know, what if you think of them in sets of, of according to the sarabans or the single movements? Or I covered that in the article that where I interviewed Peter Vispelve and Jan Fogler. So that's on string somewhere. I'm sure you can find it. Um, um, what is your balance between technique and repertoire? Well, in my case, it's way, 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 way towards repertoire. And which, you know, I have the balance. Wow, what a concept. But at least I'm, I'm comforted by, by what Piatigorsky said, I think, and, and probably other great performers have said that, you know, no matter how well you play, uh, uh, no matter how well you play it, the music is always better than you. So, so... And how do you start learning a new piece? How does this differ between chamber orchestral and solo rep? Well, it's been my experience that 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 you can you can learn a lot from listening to to recordings and but the experience of of, of actually playing a piece for the first time with an orchestra or with a chamber ensemble is is like 
a moment of passage. It's it all fits together in such a way that you never realized how what your place in the overall scheme was. Until you are there, your part is the most important. Um, how many hours a day should one practice? Wow. You know, if I do 30 minutes a day, I'm really happy. I occasionally reach an hour, but not often. It's a fight to try to keep to my schedule, which is to practice every morning at 9.30. Um, I, deepening my, deepening my, oh, deepening my musical imagination you know, the more I hear other people do wonderful things, the more I think my musical imagination, wow, is so, is so limited. You have to be humble about those things, I guess. Wow. You know, and I, I think, why, why do I practice it still? If I didn't have these friends to play with, I might stop practicing again. Except my wife wouldn't like that. So um, I don't know. If there are no more questions, unless somebody wants to ask me something. Yeah, I think that marks the end of our questions. Uh, if you could give any closing remarks, that would be great. And I'll let you know when our live stream has concluded. Okay. So for in closing, I, I, I can't recommend this experience enough, returning to the cello, taking it up, or any instrument, taking it up, taking it up whenever you can. You know, it, before I did that, I was sort of removed from what was going on. But since... I've seen how much happiness it's brought to so many people. The, pe the people in the orchestra in France, my friends up the street, the, the many friends I made at the, at, the, at the chamber music camp. It was, it was, you know, they all had their life restored to them. One was a, a, a clarinetist an amateur clarinetist who now that he retired from being an ophthalmologist he or an eye surgeon he just travels around looking for friends to play with looking for it's it's like you have you have your life given back to you in a way i don't think you ever could have imagined before so i say go for it Reach out to people in your community, especially professionals, because they love to hear from, from us, from us amateurs. And thank you, Cello Bello, for allowing me to ramble on. Um,